What's up, everybody? This is ZK Live, episode 16. We are back for part two. Uh, we were just in an awesome discussion on social media, um, how to start marketing your company on social media. I was going into some like nerdy stuff about engagement and sort of how to get like views and, and what works. Um, so let's keep talking about social media. As a side note, I just ended this live and for the first time since we started this, however many months ago now, a couple months ago, I was able, I was given the option to download the video. So we've had an issue with this. I bought an app that will let me download the video later, but uh, we had, at first we had no way to get the video off of IGTV once we posted it. Um, this is kind of one of the things that happens with Instagram and with the social medias is they're constantly evolving and constantly changing. Um, which is awesome because they're generally, they're always getting better. Um, but I think when I did short videos, I had the option to download the video, but when I did these hour long videos, it was not giving me the option. Sorry. So I just went to end this video and I asked, uh, I was asked to download the video. So I'm pretty sure I downloaded it. I posted it anyway, just to be safe, but we're working on for Tuesday. Everybody hold me accountable for this. Tuesday, that's when we do lives again, right? We are going to, I'm going to start having a cover photo that will not just be like random pictures of me and the other person. And I sit here like between and I'm touching to try to find two pictures of, and there's a bunch of words covering like the guest's face. And I'm trying to like touch a spot on the timeline for the cover photo where we both don't look ridiculous. Um, and instead we're going to actually start to create cover photos that we cover pictures that we'll put up like ZK Live episode this with this is the person and it will be preloaded. And you have what I have to do is create that photo before the episode starts. And then I have to go in and Chris knows, I'm sure. Um, and then I have to go in and upload that when it asks me for a cover photo, I can go to my camera roll and upload one. So I did say I wanted to have that for this episode, but I got busy. Um, Tuesday, the interns are going to be in and we're going to create one. Uh, so if I don't, please everyone make fun of me on Tuesday. Uh, but I've, I'm really hoping to have a cover photo this time. But very exciting. Instagram is getting better. These lives have gotten better. If anyone's noticed, I think the connections have been better. Um, and also now you can download a full hour. <clears throat> All right. So let's go back into um, how to market your company on social media. On Instagram, I guess. Sorry. I've been talking for like an hour and I feel like just getting going. Yeah, much better, right? Like we had a lot of difficulty with Instagram Live when we were first starting these. Um, and not just me. I know some people who work for um, Adam Dias, who was on this show. His girlfriend works for a, a large, a very large, like Fortune 100 company. And she's in the marketing department. And they were having conversations with Facebook and Instagram about this topic specifically. And they said they were working on it. So, um and they always are. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, so back to growing a social media following and how to market your company. I think we, I'm gonna just keep going over it, but I think it's have a plan. Again, it, not even social media, but a marketing plan or a, having a company, you need to have a marketing plan. And you need to know what you do that makes you special. What are your competitive advantages? What are the things that are gonna make you add value? What is your unique, um, what do they call it? Um, Value proposition, there's a term for it. Um, not MVP, that's minimum viable product, but it's something value proposition. Unique valuable proposition, we'll call it that, but that's I'm missing it. Uh, but you have to do something special, add value to the market. Like why, why you and not somebody else? Is it just because someone happened to find you first? I hope not, because if, if you're, the value you bring to the market is that somebody found you first, you're not going to do very well over the long period of time. It's going to be tough to grow a company when that's the best value you offer. Uh, so figure out what, what your unique value proposition is, the few things you do special, and then start to look at other people and I fo you follow other accounts and, and talk to people. What are the types of posts that you can make? So we make a lot of process, a lot of behind the scenes content uh, if you follow us. Um, we make lots of behind the scenes content. We make, um, some educational stuff, some entertaining stuff, hopefully 
the Holy Grail is it's, inter, it's educational and it's entertaining at the same time. If you can make entertaining and educational content on a regular basis, you're going to do very well. That's not an easy thing to do. Everyone, we people have very short attention spans and there's millions of entities who are vying for people's attention. So in order to get their attention, you, you it, it's not easy. You have to do some stuff well. Um, so you're trying to get their attention. Um, and then... So, and then final photos. I think final photos are good. I, I've been guilty of not doing many of them. Like most, for most of my getting here, like we didn't do a whole lot of final photos. That's not what built my following. Um, but I think they're very valuable still. But more than anything, it's the process. Um, in a conversation with a client, sometimes it's in a sales process, getting into the nitty gritty of what you're about to go do is not a good way to sell the job. There are, there are, I went to a, again, if you're not part of the paint contractors association, PCA, and you're trying to get better at running a paint company, you're really missing out on a lot of value. I went to the PCA national expo this year and I set in on a talk about um, buying type buyer types and how to sell to the different buyer types. And this guy from a university actually was there and he was breaking down all their extensive research into the types of buyers there are. And he got into, there's like, and I'm going to, I can't remember them all right now, but there is the analytical buyer who I, he, I remember he needs lots of time. They need lots of time to make their decision and they can make it based off of many facts. So they're the ones, the one group that's going to do well when you sell Here's what I'm going to do and here's the science behind what I'm doing. There's one group who will really love it and buy from you if you sell with the tactics of here's how great at painting I am and here's all the science behind it. So that's how I sold for a long time only. And which is great. Like every time I ran into an analytical buyer, I probably sold that job. But then I probably didn't sell the jobs to a bunch of other people who wanted a different set of information. So social media is a way for you to give that the, to show the analytical, the, the technical side of your business without having to like, you can put it in the captions and people can choose to read. You can choose to read my captions on my post or not read the captions on my post. I feel like I'm losing a bunch of people. Maybe I should start talking about painting more. Uh, if, if that's true, please someone tell me. Um, so Putting, putting up the, those process posts are really valuable because you get to sort of hit both or two or three people at once, types of buyers at once. You put up a very edge captivating post picture. It's like, whoa, look, look at that. I, so someone gets to see what it's going to look like. And then you can get into the really nitty gritty stuff about like what's going on here. And you can almost have two, like some of my um, descriptions are almost broken into like two parts one softer and more about our team and one is more about like very analytical stuff right but i've been able to now hit the three types of buyers with the with a piece of information that's always going to be there and now you use the, use the highlights if you're not using highlights uh i wish I, I could do a better job and i'll probably do a highlights audit soon but use the highlights feature on instagram it's your friend. Because again, think about the little attention I have. So quite often I'll see guys and uh, I'm going to step, let's not say that, but if I'm anybody and I find out about your company and I go to your profile, oh my God, that's the holy grail. If you can get somebody to touch on your profile and go look at your profile on Instagram, that's really hard to get people to your profile. That there's a reason Instagram tracks profile views. Um, now you have to have a good profile. It the, Half the battle or most of the battle is getting them there. Because again, we're assuming that we're good. If you're good at what you do, make sure that your profile very quickly shows that. I, can, I hope if you go to mine, you would see very quickly what we stand for, what we're all about. And, and I hope that it looks pretty. I, I try to structure my sentences so they're they're like the, the long sentence, then a shorter sentence, and a shorter sentence, and a shorter sentence. So it kind of all goes down nice. 
Um, it tr I try to make it look nice. And then, and the highlights, because I have, I don't know, I have over 500 posts now, I believe. No one's scrolling to my 432nd post to find out about that time I did a garage door that's exactly like their garage doors that they would love to know existed. But I have my highlight section at the top. So I have a garage door highlights that you can now touch and it'll, it'll show you all of the garage doors that we've worked on. Um, I would encourage you all to start to categorize your posts. So you, in order to make a highlight, you have to make a story first. So when I'll make a post, I make a post and I'll put it on my story and I'll pick your color. So if you don't know how to do this, you can pick a color on your pen, the little squiggly line when you go to make a story. You can pick a color by going to that squiggly line and then it's like a pencil. You can go to a color, any of the colors at the bottom, and if you hold the color, you can then, it'll pop up like a thing and then you can move that around to change the color. And then once you pick the color you like, you can hold the background down, like touch anywhere not on that picture you posted, hold that down and the whole background will change that color. This only works if you're, re, if you're posting if it's a post that you're putting onto your story, if you put a picture onto your story and you try to do this, the picture will be covered up by that solid color. It's really annoying. Um, but so if you look at mine, hopefully most of my highlights have a ZK blue in the background with the hashtag that says something that's going on in this picture and then the post. So if you're a client and you're looking for garage doors, you can go to my highlights section, see the garage doors and not have to scroll through my entire feed to try to find door projects that have that. So curate your feed for potential clients. It's very valuable. Um, I feel like I've gone on for a long time about this. Um, engagement's down. I'm going to start answering questions because that might be boring to people. Um, they're like, dude, you're a painter. Shut up and talk about painting. Um, how do you know when the time how do you know when the time was right to expand your business from yourself to growing a team? Um, I would say, let's see, when there's a few things, I, I would try to raise your rates and well, what are your goals? Do you want to have a big company? If you want to have a big company, there's probably a different way of going about it than if you just need to hire a couple people to sort of meet demand and not lose out on great projects. Um, I think that first you want to like, that was a great thing for the crash course. Thanks, man. Um, I, I've thought a fair amount about this stuff. That's how I have the following I have is I, I definitely have spent time trying to optimize what we do on here. Um, again, just try to learn all the time, whatever you're doing, just try to learn. Um, back to what was that question? Oh, expanding your team. So, we talk about this all the time. It's one of my fascinations in business, this basic economic theory of uh, supply and demand. And if supply is constricted and demand increases, then price goes up, right? If a, if a hundred people want you to come paint for them and you can only do one paint job this month, then the one out of a hundred who's willing to pay the most will get to hire you. Therefore your prices will be high, right? Supply and demand. So, I would encourage you to always keep some demand fairly higher than supply. And that's the game. As a business owner, you are playing with, and, and you, the way you play with it is with pricing, generally. You're playing with supply and demand all the time by using your pricing. So when demand is through the roof, if you're a one-man band, like you, like I tell, if you're a one-person painter and you're, you're trying to run, do this thing, like you should be... 80 90 dollars an hour like you should be expensive way more than me right if if i get to hire you and you're going to come do the work only you and you've been painting for 15 years and, and you eat sleep and breathe it and you love painting you should be commanding top top dollar because arguably you should be faster than a guy working for a company right so in that hour you can get more things done so you should get paid more for that hour. And you don't have to, it doesn't take a lot of jobs to stay busy for the month if you're a one man band, right? So that means that it should be easier. You should be able to get, you should be able to give pricing that 
keeps most people away and keeps just enough people that keep you busy, but you make good money. So that's the thing I would start with. I would, first of all, you have to get your hourly rate high enough so that you can afford to pay employees. Uh, if you are charging $35 an hour today, you cannot afford to pay employees, not legally. I, and again, someone prove, tell me that, prove me that I'm wrong. But if you are charging $35 an hour, you're not charging enough. Let's just put it that way. Um, that's not enough to run a company. That's enough to be a guy that's just working for himself, working for himself. That's not a business. That's you don't show up, you get by like fine. But if you have to pay all the different things you have to pay to run a company and all the time that's not spent working. Now, if you factor that in to all that, like if you're getting paid $35 an hour to work, but you're spending all this other time picking up supplies, estimating, blah, 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 blah. The, lot, the list goes on and on. Anyone who runs a company knows there's a ton of time that goes into running a company and keeping the work coming, right? So you got to charge enough where you your hourly rate is high enough where you can afford to pay somebody to come in and work and you can make a profit. So again, I would say that that's at a minimum, that's $45 an hour at a minimum. I would never hire an employee until I was billing at at least $45 an hour. If not, I would, I would want to see $50 an hour or higher. Um, again, I'm, 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 this is just my personal opinion. This is, I think I see a lot of guys who are doing it the opposite way and it causes a lot of pain. Um, get your hourly rates up. The way you get your hourly rates up are you is you build demand and you keep supply the same. So keep making a bunch of people happy. Keep doing a great job and don't bring on any employees. So now you have this like over three years, you'll have a bunch of people who want you to come back and paint again. Guess what? Now you get to raise your prices and you're going to lose clients. Great. That's fine. They hired you because you were cheap in the first place. They got lucky, right? All my first clients from eight, seven years ago, they were getting the deal of a lifetime. They were, in fact, they were taking advantage of me. I didn't know it at the time. Many of them were. Um, so before you go out and try to hire employees, make sure that you have a steady stream of work. I have nine employees. Um, make sure you have a steady stream of work and make sure that you, like you have like, you have a bunch of, um, what they call like chickens, right? Like make sure you have a bunch of chickens that are bringing you people, bringing you leads. Like you have, whether that be like, like raving fan employee, um, clients, who just like tell everyone they know about you. Like that's the, if you first start a company, you should be doing everything in your power to, to make the, the, the good clients, you should turn them into raving fans, right? Because then they're going to be, that's going to feed you work. So figure out, get a way to get work coming in, right? That's the hardest part when you first start because first people who are going to hire you are horrible. They're taking advantage of you. They know that you, you don't have an option. And so your first generally, and it's all generally, you, some guys get lucky. Um, we would like to be two months out. And I also have nine guys. So hopefully I can now, if, if an emergency project comes in, we have the ability to be flexible a little bit. Um, I used to want to have a really, really long queue. Um, I, I think that they're, uh, that's missing the mark a bit. Uh, but again, it depends on what you want. To make the most amount of money, don't have an eight month, um, don't be booked out eight months. I think you make a lot more money being booked out two months. Um, but that's just, that's running the business stuff. Um, so, but yeah, don't hire employees until you can get your hourly rates up, get them, get those hourly rates up, like way up. You gotta, and, and if you're tracking all of your time as a person working for themselves, you're going to see, okay, maybe I bid are you on site during jobs too? Uh, I, I like stop in. I'm like, I'm not on site on a daily basis all day long. I, I fill in the gaps everywhere. I power wash for like five hours the other day with an apprentice. I stayed in a deck last week. Power wash the deck and stay in the deck last week. But no, my job is to keep the machine moving. So I fill in wherever I need to. And I eat all the problems for breakfast. My job as a business owner, John Shear, this is another quote from John Shear. It's one of the most important things you could, anyone could ever tell you. As a business owner, your job is to eat problems for breakfast. 
That's it. So when someone tells you that, someone he John has told me my job is to eat problems for breakfast enough times where now when problems come up, most of the time I'm able to like smile and eat them and solve them because that's my job, right? Instead of, oh, a problem happened. Oh my God, I got to stop problems from happening. Problems shouldn't be happening. I'm a failure because problems are happening. No. The business owner's job is to eat the problems for breakfast, solve them, moving on. The, when things are going perfect, they don't need me. <laughs> so I, I think that's, that was a, that's a great piece of advice when you're working for yourself or you're trying to build a company is the owner's job is to eat all the problems for breakfast, is to deal with all the problems. They don't call me when things are, when the job went smooth as silk, no one calls me. So guess what? My phone rings most of the time when there's something that has to be dealt with, but that's my job. And when you see it as your job, it's easier to go do all that with a, a smile on your face. I think when you look at your job, maybe as not being that and, and problems arise, maybe it's a little bit harder to go and tackle them with a smile. So if, if, any, if that helped anyone, that helped me a ton. Uh, again, I'm a huge fan of perspective. How you view the world will dictate so much in your life. It, at least that's been my, the case for me, is how you view the world will dictate so much about how you react to it and what you get out of it. Um, so perspective is, is huge. Um, again, if you're before you to reiterate one more time, I don't mean you bill by the hour EA. I mean, you estimate by the hour, right? We have an hourly rate that we are estimating by. That's what I mean by that. When I talk about hourly rate, if you're billing at $500 for an eight man for eight hours for the a man day, right? 500 divided by eight is whatever that is. <laughs> um, What's that? I can't. My my brain is fried right now. Um, but you get what I'm saying. Um, sorry, I just lost it. I tried to do math after like riffing for that long. Sherwin Williams paint. What's your opinion? We talked about this, but Sherwin Williams makes great paint. Um, every paint, most paint companies make good paint. Uh, it, the question is, what is good? How are we defining good? Uh, for, for many contractors, um, access to easy access to paint is the most important part for many people. So there you go. 62.5. Thanks, man. Um, yeah. So if you're billing it, if you're estimating at $500 a man day, that's $62 and 50 cents an hour. Um, I would say that if you're a one man band, um, in a in in the East Coast, New England, where I'm at, I mean, obviously, and if you're in the middle of nowhere in Oklahoma, like you're not going to be billing the same hourly rate as I do because my cost of living is way higher here. So it's kind of all relative, I guess. Um, but you know, you need you need to make sure that you're making enough money where you can pay somebody a good wage to work for you. Um, and well, when they're your first employee, it's work with you, not for you. Um, I, I think that's the piece I definitely missed in the beginning. It was like, oh, I have all these employees. Like, I have all this revenue coming in. It doesn't mean anything. Like, we're not in business to have revenue, and we're not in business to have employees. We're in business to make money. Um, and the way you make money is by adding value to the world in a way. You add more value to the world than you take, right? Every Look at all the billionaires. They, they built companies that added more value to the world than they took. They added tons of value. And so they got to take some of that value back in the form of money. Um, do you depend on planning before I start work the next day to revitalize your business? Do you depend on planning before I start work the next day? Seven fifty a lot for an apprentice. A, a, a week. For a 40-hour week? Someone do the math on that. <laughs> I'm not doing math right now. Our, man, one man bank can work for six months when you just started the company. After that, you need to hire people because you lose time, you lose jobs, you lose money. Well, if you want to work by yourself, that's fine. But like I said, I think a one man band should be charging significantly more than an established company in that same area per hour. 
right? Now, so they're pricing. So in that equation, sometimes their pricing may be fairly similar. They, they still might be a little bit more. Hopefully, they're still a little bit more. Uh, it depends on what your niche market is. But a lot of people do like to hire a, a guy. Who they, the guy who does the estimate is going to show up. That There's a lot to be said for that. Now, some clients want a team to show up and the job to be done in two days. You're not going to win those jobs. So forget about those clients. But I think that there are some clients who would pay a premium to somebody who was going to show up and do the work that estimated and that, that is the company. Um, so target those clients. Um, don't forget that when you first start your company that like you're going to get, a, you're going to get some pieces of feedback, some data, right? The, the first time you give an estimate will be like N of one. That'll be your first piece of data. Don't, don't determine the rest of your company's life on the one piece of data you get. The first time you talk to the client and something happens, like, please don't project out the rest of your career based off of one client's like interaction. Um, if you start to run into the same thing over and over and over, yeah, maybe like that's true for life. Like if the world keeps slapping you in the face, like maybe you should do something different. But, you know, I think that we're superstitious natives at heart as people. And so when you first start off and you go to do an estimate and a client says this or they, someone does that, you start to be like, oh, the whole world is like that. And it's like, well, wait, maybe you're like missing out on the great client that was the next estimate that you can't even make because you're too busy doing the job that you just booked for a crappy client and you blow that client off because, oh, I'm overwhelmed. I have too much work, right? I think that perspective is very important. And, and so keep trying to raise your rates when you're a one-man band. Like that's that's the time. You get to experiment. You get to do awesome R&D. And all it takes is one job to book you up for the next three weeks. Like it's beautiful. And for that three weeks, then I would be playing with my estimating. I would be experimenting with what I can do. <laughs> uh, Jake Bresson he we've had this conversation um, and I, I, we're going to touch I'm going to touch basically this week and see how it's going um, I've had two people now recently talk to me and say oh I'm booked up for the whole summer and they're like small companies one or two person that's not a good thing um, you don't want to be booked up for the whole summer before the summer starts if you're a one or two man per company Especially when you're new. Maybe Jessica d did that, but she's $120 an hour. So if you're $120 an hour and you're booked up for the whole summer, that's not, we're not talking about you. But you don't want to, you don't want to sell all your jobs and book all your time instantly. I know there's a tendency to want to do that. Um, people are asking me paint questions now. Let's go back. Uh, what are the services you offer? Yeah, we, we're interior and exterior. Um, we're coding. We're experts at applying coatings. So we apply coatings at a high level for clients who want a positive customer experience, customer service experience, and a really high quality paint job. Um, that's sort of that's what we're looking to do. Someone asked me, um, "Do you paint the ceiling or the walls first? Um, generally, we're going to paint the ceiling first, almost always, almost always. I mean, come on." It is so much easier to cut that wall line with gravity on your side while you paint that line than it is to cut the ceiling. First of all, white doesn't cover very well. So you'd much rather have white come down on your walls and then cover over white than the color come up on your walls and try to cut upside down, cut a straight line with white over a color. That's a, that is a, um, oh, the guy, then he said, just kidding. Oh, you got me. <laughs> you will never get to the highest market level doing everything by yourself. You need the rep you need your representative like professional, especially getting big jobs for a nice GC. Yes. I mean, I know what you're saying. Uh, I there is evidence that would contradict what you just said there. Um, Jessica Allred was on this show. Uh, I would encourage everyone to go back and watch Jessica's um podcast with us it was with me it was amazing she's amazing you should all follow her alternative finishes she is 120 dollars an hour uh she has a helper uh she has an assistant apprentice um and she's booked for she's on retainer with a a number of clients just she's on retainer with them 
and she's working in the Four Seasons in the Mandarin Oriental, and she's booked out for well over a year. Um, so, and she's doing it herself. She does the estimates. She does everything. There is a way you can do it. And that's what I'm trying to say. There is a way you can do you and, and one other person or just you. Look at a lot of the decorative painters. A lot of the decorative painters work by themselves. But, excuse me, most decorative painters are charging. They get it because they're, that's, they're in a world where more people charge more money. And they get it. And they understand that they need to charge. Like, I was on a job with Iris Marcus, who's like this amazing. If you don't, if you guys don't know Iris, I should try to get her on here. I'm, oh, she's on Instagram. We should try to get Iris on. She's like this old house's decorative painter. She's one of the most amazing humans you'll ever meet. She's just like Jessica. They're just awesome. She's on a job. Um, she was doing some uh, Venetian on a job. It's the second job now we've worked on that she's been on. Um, and again, she works by herself. And her hourly rate, she's probably $200 an hour. If you look at how she bids, she's like, she makes really good money. She's in ex absurd demand. She's a legend. She's been around forever. She provides an amazing product. So demand is really high for her. Um, so you can do the same thing. That's what I'm saying. Like if you want to just be you and someone else, if you're really good, uh, the decorative painters are sort of, I think there's a lot of decorative painters who have that down. Um, what's your go-to interior trim these days? Hall and Lack Satin, Hall and Lack Brilliant, Hall and Lack in general, I guess. Fine Paints of Europe, Oil Enamel, nothing like it. I love it. If you've not used Fine Paints of Europe, Oil Enamel, I suggest everyone at least try. That brings me to, uh, there's more people saying things. Um, all right, so a guy reached out to me this week. This is a ridiculous idea, and if everyone thinks it's stupid, please let me know. We won't have to do it. But I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, if I was watching this show five years ago, I would have jumped at the opportunity to do this. But again, I don't know, whatever. I kind of feel a little weird about this. But uh, we're going to do a contest, a Fine Paints of Europe cabinet door contest um, for anyone who wants to participate. Um, I'll talk to Fine Paints. I'm sure we can figure out some sort of a prize uh, if, if they don't want to get down on it, which I'm sure they will. But if not... Um, I'll figure out a prize with my team. But it was suggested to me that we have this contest where, and I'll post about it, where painters can take Fine Paints of Europe, Hall & Lack Brilliant, that's their oil high gloss, and paint a cabinet door with it. And we are going to have a contest to see who can paint the best cabinet door with Fine Paints of Europe, Hall & Lack Brilliant. Um, I'm not going to judge. My team is going to judge. So... What we're going to do, this is going to take some time because in order to ship, um, and again, it, and it, it's going to cost a lot of time and money from people's pockets. So I don't know if anybody wants to do it. But if he was saying it would, it would motivate him to get better. Um, and that I am game for. I, I love motivation. I, I'm a guy who likes to like put, put my back against the wall and have to rise to the level of the occasion. So I think if I was five years ago, I would have loved if there was a master certified painter who was doing a contest on cabinet doors. Because as part of this, we're going to critique, not just critique, but give like lots of tips on how to up your game. So wherever your game is at with Fine Paints of Europe, it, it's where it's at. Um, not a problem. Um, but we're going to have everybody... Yeah. Well, hey, if you can buff it, man, send that one too. Send in your best. If you want to be, if you're, and we can have two categories. We'll see how many people enter. Maybe we'll have two categories of a brushed finish and a sprayed finish. That way guys who aren't into spraying can also compete. Because doing a, a, high, a high end, a, a very a high level, I should say, fine paint severe brush finish is, is actually, is arguably the, the most expensive painting you can do in residential. Um, or at least in the most demand, not the most demand, but it commands the highest price. Um, but what if we want to do, try to, yeah, perfect brush. So we're going to have a contest. Um, assuming that I, enough people reach out and say uh, you're in, they're, they're interested, um, take a cabinet door, paint it with gloss. Don't pick white. Just don't pick white, please. Uh, the darker the color... 
you you will so this is good it's like diving right if you just jump off the diving board and do a dive straight into the water that's like using white uh if you want to do like the triple lutz backflip with all the twists that has a 10.0 difficulty you're going to use black black gloss is the hardest gloss there is um <laughs> Phil Stave's going to take bribes uh, you can roll it and say it's sprayed. You can do whatever you want. Um, but send them in. We're not going to charge anything. You guys have to, um, obviously you have to get a cabinet door and you have to get the paint and you have to put it on there. So it's a lot of time energy from you guys. Uh, we're not, we have no, I have no interest in charging. I, I hope that's what you meant. We're just, we are going to objectively rate them on this show on a Sunday night. I will take the cabinet doors and we will rate them um, very, I'm not going to show them, my team, who did what. Um, we'll try to make this like uh, in uh, music when they do the auditions for like the cellist at the New York Symphony Orchestra. They sit behind a curtain so they don't see who it's a woman and find out, oh wait, the women are just as good, if not better at piano than uh, the men. That was a thing. I don't know if you guys knew that, but... Um, I, th I think it was the women were not getting selected to be in the symphony orchestras. And then they started putting curtains up and magically women um, were getting spots because they were awesome at playing music. But people were like, oh, women can't play music or something like that. I could be butchering that. But we're going to try to do our version of the curtain up. Um, very objective. Uh, no, you don't, don't buy the paint from me. Buy the paint from Fine Paints of Europe. You can buy it. You can get it from a local store. Contact them. Uh, physically send me it. Uh, I don't have a referral code with FPE. <laughs> I just love the paint. It's changed my life. It's amazing. When all of you use it, um, you'll see. Um, so you're going to, you're going to take a cabinet door. You're going to paint it. You're going to let it cure for, I would recommend for two weeks before you ship it. When you ship it, um, you're not going to want to wrap it in, um, foam. We'll, we'll put, maybe we'll put this all out there. You're going to want to um, put like wax paper. You're going to want to cover it in wax paper and ship it out like that. And we'll probably take into consideration if things happen in the shipping. Um, man, they have sick metal finishes even for cabinets. Um, we can get into the metal. We'll do a metal contest later if anyone's using metal like we do. Um, yeah, so we're going to – I think this could be like a fun – I don't know. I would have loved this. That's why I'm doing this. Someone brought it up. I think it's a great idea. We're going to, um, we're going to do contests and my team is going to judge, um, the finish. And he was saying that way he could get, uh, feedback on his finish, learn how to do it better and, and progress. So if people are interested, send me a DM, um, if I get enough DMs, then I will have uh, my apprentice, my um, assistant, my um, one of my interns. She'll put together a document that lists um, sort of the details. Um, oh, EA painting. What's the judges? <laughs> oh man! So no judges will be paid off. We're gonna have a very objective. Uh, judging team on this one I can assure you I'm very into that if you haven't noticed so we have a giveaway coming up very soon we're 300 away from 30,000 followers when we do that giveaway I am going to have the app on my phone that randomly selects um, names we're going to load it in and live we're going to select the winners um, I that partnership that's sort of dissolving is in a social media marketing company and um, I'll tell you that Many giveaways are rigged. Let's just put it that way. Um, I've never done a rigged giveaway, but I know people do. Uh, we're not going to rig this giveaway. We're going to be very fair and objective. Um, my man's asking about Venetian plaster. I saw a paragraph back here. I'm not the guy to ask about Venetian plaster. What do you think about Venetian plaster? I think it's coming back strong from 10 years ago. I even saw Idaho painter holding a Venetian plaster trial in his hand, and I respect the guy. I respect the guy a lot. Yeah, I well, I, I think Venetian plaster is plaster's coming back strong, um, no question. Whether it be Venetian, um, I'm that gloss job. I oh man, I have to get back to the designer. I just realized I forgot to. Um, 
the plastic's coming back real strong. <laughs> real strong. I saw Chris Polidoro's a quote he, he submitted for a new construction, and there was a $600,000 budget for plaster on the job. Plaster is, is here and is no joke. So, yeah, I, I think it's really cool. We're trying to learn. Um, I think we're going to be doing a, a plaster type of paint where you roll it on and then, like, brush some, like, texture into the plaster, uh, lime plaster stuff. Um, very cool stuff. Um, yeah, so let's say if I get five DMs from people who are interested in the giveaway, in the in the um, contest, then we will do the contest. Um, and then, Jake, you asked three simple things paint contractors can do to better their business and the industry as a whole. Um... I should have spent more time thinking about this. I feel like I've gone over three things so far. I will say um, the number one thing that comes to mind that you could do to better your business and the industry as a whole is always be learning and always be thinking. Like take pride. It starts with taking pride in being a painter. And with pride comes the ability and the desire to want to better oneself, right? If you're proud, I was talking to uh, Stephen, one of our apprentices. We were driving back from Boston. And he's like, I'm proud to be an apprentice painter. Nothing made me happier. I love this kid. He's, he's a beast. Uh, he's got, again, he's starting an Instagram account soon. You guys will have to all go follow him. All of our new people are awesome. Our whole team is amazing. I'm so lucky. Uh, but he was saying, he's like, I'm proud to be an apprentice painter. And... I'm not, I was not proud to flip burgers. I'm not pr like, you know, when you're doing all these other jobs, he's like, I'm not proud. He's like, I get to say I'm an apprentice painter, right? So my recommendation would be, first off, take pride in what you do. Be prideful to be a painter. And then study. Yes, like John said, study. Take this shit, this stuff seriously. Sorry. I studied, I have studied painting for a very long time. A very long time. That's how I was able to get certified by Fine Paints of Europe. Never mind Master Certified. I I had studied painting. I understood. That I was talking to Stephen all about that. This kid's full of questions. We drive to Boston and back. He's asking me so many great, deep questions, but also for you, for many of us painters, very, very superficial. Why primer? Why paint? What is clear coat? You know, but he's asking all these things. And... I just got off track. Seeing these little people talk down here and my brain goes nuts. Um, but it's, yeah, take pride and study it. Um, think about it. Just, uh, just think about what you're doing as much as you can. Um, $30 per square foot of, of what, wall space? That's really low for the city. That's low. I, I know guys that are charging $60, $65 a square foot. Um, how do you start off getting the work? Um, I mean, any by any means possible. Um, I am a big... I got here by faking it till you make it. I, I've got t-shirts made. I At the time, I had a crappy car, but I, had, I got a magnet made. I put it on the side of my, my car. I got business cards. Um, if you've done a fine paints gloss job, you'll understand why $30 a square foot is low to do the level that if you see what's going on out there, that when, when you charge $65 a square foot, you're giving them a mirror in order to do that. It takes a lot of time. So if you haven't tried it, you should join this contest that we have paint a cabinet door and haul neck brilliant, send it to us. We'll rate it. We'll give you some tips you'll understand what goes into uh, FPE at the high level. It's no joke. Um, how do you, but back to this guy. Wow, I understand it's a lot of job. A lot of job. Yeah, it's a, it's a many, 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 many hours spent not painting but prepping. How do you start off getting to work? Yes. So essentially, like when you first start, man, Hopefully, hopefully you've been working for an established painting company and you've been doing side work. That's like, if you're going to start a painting company, I'll get to the books um, 
Oh, to learn to paint books, that's tough. I don't have a lot of those. Paint Talk is a forum that I read every post on Paint Talk. Um, I believe it's still up. You can probably still read a lot of those posts. Um, maybe one day I'll write a book. <laughs> um, what are antistatic rags and where do I get them? Devilbus sells antistatic rags. Uh, if you do an A-B test of no antistatic rag and antistatic rag with Hollenack Brilliant, you will see a difference in dust in the finish, for sure. Yes, this John is on to it. So here is the formula that I would give you for starting your own company is work for an established painting company. Be a boss. Be so good, right? Excelling, outperforming everyone there. And have the ability to want to work for yourself and have the ability to want to continue to learn way more stuff than what it takes to paint. It is a whole, John can attest, it is a whole other ball game to run a company. So if you're into all that stuff and you're, you know what, like I, you love to learn, you love to work hard and you want to own a painting company. Okay. So you have your side work. That's where you're going to start. You're going to build up your side work with professionalism. Be more professional than the company you're working for today. So whatever practices the company you're working for is using, take them and start, again, we're talking about think, analyze, think. What could be better? What other industries do certain things better than our industry when it comes to customer service? What are the things you could do to be even better than the company that you're working for? Because you have to be way better at, at giving a paint job, which is not painting, but at providing a paint job to a client than your boss does. Because he's in business for how many, many years he's been in business. He has a built-in network, right? So, and now you could always just undercut him on price. Hey guys, if you want to start a paint company tomorrow and you want to get a bunch of work, put out cheap prices. No problem. You will have work. But guess what? You'll make way, way, way less money than if you, and you'll have way more stress than if you just work for somebody. So don't use price as a way to get jobs all the time. I hate that. That's what's causing all the problems in our industry is people are just like undercutting to, to get work instead of think, what do we say? The three tips I have for businesses, think about how you can be better, how you can add more value to the, to the market, right? So if that's the case, I'm going to start to build my side work out and I'm going to be as professional with my side work as I can. I'm going to be even more professional than my boss. And once you've been able to do that, and you're, you're keeping track of your hours and how long it takes you to do things. How long did you take? Did you spend not painting on that job? Did you go out and look at that job twice? Did you help them with color? Did you run to the paint store three times? Right? If you did all those things, total up how many hours it was, now you got to figure out what does it really cost to do that job. It's more than what it costs to just do the work. So that's my, my advice is, oh, I think he responded and said, um, I get side work here and there on my own from offer, but from my own, from offer up and stuff. I don't know what that means, but so you need to look at your side work like it's your, your first client and you need to blow them away. You need to give them the best customer experience they've ever had in their life and turn them into a raving fan. When you can have five raving fans that are out there telling everyone and their brother, you've got to use my painter. He's amazing. He's, it's only side work right now, so it's tough to get him. But when you get him, he's so good. If you can't get someone to say that, don't go out on your own. I promise you. Because I, I can promise you right now, your side work is cheaper than your boss and everybody else out there. So half the reason they hired you is because you're cheap. So you better absolutely blow them away with service so you can get paid what it costs. Once you outgrow your... John said, once you outgrow your boss, then time to start grinding for any extra hours you have. Yes. One weird question. If you do painting here in my seat or they don't allow you to use oil-based paint in the buildings, they could swim. Well, how do you solve this? Check out um, Skyline Painting. Peter from Skyline Painting. They are they're in New York City and they apply a ton of fine paints of Europe eco at the highest levels. Um, I like, feel like I'm just getting going and we have 10 minutes left. Watch out for your lead painters. They don't like when you outperform them. Watch out for the lead painters. They don't like when you have... I mean, I hope that you're a lead painter before you leave. Like, let's be real. Be a lead painter on a crew before you leave. Um, don't paint with... 
the dial cranked EFC on the handheld. Don't know. It's like Craigslist. Offer it. Offer up is like. Oh, it's like Craigslist. Oh, okay, okay. It's a serious problem here. Raving fans is so important. Steve. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. John is on to it. I didn't invent this stuff. If you can't get people to be raving fans in the beginning, you're going to have a much more difficult... But I think that's a mindset. Again, we talked about mindset. When you first start, I don't think most people who start paint companies have any idea what they're getting into. Unless you started with College Pro and someone taught you how to really run a company or, or you've been at very high levels in real established companies, which, let's be honest, most people start painting companies are painting for some guy and... A, they get laid off. B, they're like, I can do this better. Or, or they're lazy, actually, and they want to make their own hours. They don't want to get, they don't want the boss to be pissed when they don't show up because they went out late one night. That's when most of the painter companies start from. That's why competition is where it's at. Um, go think about what is that client, like, what do they want? How can I blow their mind? Listen to podcasts about business, about startups. Like, think, think, think. That's my, if you want to get my, my three things you can do, it's think, think, think. Like, just spend all the time thinking about this stuff. Because if you're going to run a business, you're competing. We're, it's, it's basic economics and capitalism. You're going to compete against a bunch of other entities. And guess what? They're out there thinking about this stuff all the time. And they probably have been in business a lot longer than you. So they have this whole, like, there's a, a momentum. When a company's been around for 30 years, there's a momentum that they have that is really tough to compete with. So it means you just have to work even harder. So think. That would be my advice is always think about this stuff. On the cost-effective side, what do you do? What do you advise who works alone without relying on the team? On the cost-effective side, what do you advise who works alone without relying on the team? I'm not sure I understand. A little extra details before, during, and after a project. Yes. So we, we're doing a project. Uh, Monday, we're putting the final code on. But we did a garage door and a, a front door. Um, Patty and Jason did it. And I sold that front door last year. And then for a client we had already done some work for. And then when we got there, we were talking about what should we do with the garage door. Well, there next to the front door, there is a mailbox. It's made out of wood and it's stained, similar, different wood, but stained the similar color as the front door and the garage door. It's not even a question that we're going to take that, that mailbox off. We were going to sand it down and we're going to give it the exact same application that we gave to the door and the garage door. That's not part of the bid. No one ever talked about that. But if you don't do all those little things, you hear the best companies say there's always one little thing and I, we could be better at this and I'm glad we're talking about this because... Sometimes I get busy and I forget, but I power washed a client's, um, I power washed that deck this week and I power washed his brick walkway out to the sidewalk. It, it was starting to turn a little green. I had the power washer out. Like, and he, he noticed, he came and he's like, yeah, I saw you doing that. It's like, of course, like you, why wouldn't I do one little extra thing? If you, there's a book, it, oh, we talked about books. There's a book, I can't remember the name of it. Google it. It was written by the guy who started the Ritz Carlton or ran the Ritz Carlton. He's a, I believe he's an Austrian man, very famous entrepreneur guy. He has a book about customer service. I read it. It's amazing. You should read it. Uh, if you want to think about this, like, and he talks about just going way above and beyond. You could do ten thousand dollars in other work, and they remember the little thing you threw in. That is so true. Humans are not rational. Always remember that. Think about how humans are not rational, and and and. Treat them like humans, not like robots. How many projects can you handle in a month with your people and everything? Oh, the number can vary so much. It's it's really hard to say, man. Um, I couldn't tell you. Um, we do our garage, our you know, an entry door is anywhere from like thirty five hundred to six thousand, and then we can get into like um, you know full interiors, full exteriors. It, it depends. Um, and I, and I just got to this number, so I'm just learning sort of what our payroll is each month. Again, I'm not like John. I'm not as good at the numbers yet, um, but we're working on being better at the numbers. Have you tried ScuffX on, from Benjamin Moore on trim, and what are your thoughts? Yes, we did. We just finished one. 
especially when pressure washing, when you're doing the siding. Yes, when you're pressure washing, just wash a couple extra things. Come on, you have the machine out, it, it takes you no extra time. Wash a couple extra things. Go above and beyond, and you, that's how you're going to get those raving fans. Um, I'm so glad that that's why I love doing these shows because this is the stuff like we, I do it, but I don't do it. I don't have do, I don't have a concerted effort in my mind. Sometimes I get so busy. You forget to keep doing it. Um, so I can assure you all my clients in the next few months, you're going to get even more extras because now I've been talking about it. Um, all right. So we are wrapping up as much as I'd like to keep going. It's Sunday night. Um, I'd much rather spend time with my wife than talk to you guys. I'm sorry. Um, she's awesome. And you guys are not talking back to me, really. You're texting. That's one thing. Um, all right. So I guess I could ask myself the same questions I've answered before. No, that's really not a good... Um, let's see. You always want another horror story? I can tell you. I'm sure I have a ton of horror stories. Um... Before ZK had changed all the batteries and the smoke detectors for them. Before ZK, I... Oh! That's a good one. Oh, yeah. Thanks, man. Um, I'm trying to think of some horror stories. I've had so... I think I've shared... I shared... But I'll share it again. I um, We did a couple black doors recently. And uh, I came in to spray them sprayer busted um a spring busted in our cup gun and we were gonna and i was like oh i'll just use the pressure pot and i was like dan hadn't used the pressure pot yet i was like i'll use the, i'll come in i'll spray the doors i used to spray all the doors when we first started i was the only guy painting when i first started um so i got the paint out mixed it up did all the things i always do got the gun dialed in but it'd been so long i, I something I, I didn't dial it in right the, pre the, the spray pattern was perfect, but I, I guess I just, I didn't, I didn't have the muscle memory of, you know, we always spray our paint onto a, a piece of like cardboard um, or like brown paper that we have in the booth. We spray it out and we wait for it to drip and we look, we watch the drips come down. We want the drips to come down like all together and not like this, because if they come like this, it means there's too much paint in the middle and not enough on the edges. We want the drips to all be like this. So the drips were all even. We had an even amount of paint, but way too much paint was coming out. I didn't realize. So I sprayed two 10-foot tall custom doors, and we had massive sags all over all of them. It was horrible. Hours and hours and hours of sanding. Um, really terrible. John, yeah, remind me. I, well, you reminded me now of paint. I, I, we'll have John on. Definitely. I can't believe I haven't invited you already. Um, if you guys don't know John from Paint School... John, we got to talk about how come your name of your thing is not the name of your company. Or is the name of your company Paint School? Maybe it is. Um, I'm interested to find out. EA Paint. Just get through. Oh, this guy's asking a question. What do you do if you got a job for money you want and everything was good in the beginning, but customer turn into a fucking process and giving you a hard time every second? Yeah, John's right. Like... Just get it done. Put your head down, get it done, um, and move on. Like, again, what we talked about in the beginning. Set your goals, focus on your goals, and start running in the direction of your goals. And anyone who's going to try to pull you and make you rubberneck, right? This client is going to make you rubberneck and slow down from getting to your goal and watch them over there and pay attention to them and hem and haw and complain about them. The faster you can get away from that crazy person on the side of the road, the better. So I would look at it like that. It's sort of a, let's get out of there as fast as we can. Still do a good job, be able to sleep at night, all those things. But just move on from it, EA. Do I, do I know of your, do you have a paint business page? Business page is generic biz only. I don't, I guess I don't know your paint business page. I honestly, I've said this before. I, I've slacked. I, I don't have the time to really be on Instagram the way I used to be. I have 20 seconds left too. Um, it's their castle. Put your hands down and turn your haters into fans. 
Um, all right, 10 seconds left. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining me. Send me those DMs if you want to be part of this contest. Um, and we may have more contests in the future. Thanks, guys.